panel this afternoon to the 29th Popcorn Forum. We're on our third day, and our focus today is on religion, philosophy, and art. I'm your host, Jim Minkler, and we have a number of interesting characters that have come here via the Chautauqua to speak with you today. And we're in for a real pleasure of the senses as well as the spirit and the intellect. And we're going to start off by first uh, appeal, appealing to your visual senses, and then uh, that will be with Georgia O'Keeffe, and then you will be titillated um, audibly, hopefully, by Mr. Scott Joplin, and then we'll have, look on my list here, then we'll uh, hear from Timotheus Rich, and then once again we'll be titillated with the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and then we'll listen to Catherine de' Medici, and then spiritually from Pope John the 23rd. Now, you all have cards, I think, little buff colored uh, sheets in front of you, and I would ask that at the end of today's response panel that you fill those out, please. Uh, I know it's kind of an inconvenience, but it's very important to us because uh, the Popcorn Forum is made possible in part by Humanities Grant and it's part of our responsibility uh, to make sure we fill out these, these cards to return to the Idaho uh, Humanities Council. So if you would please do that, we would appreciate it. And now, without further ado, uh, if we could dim the lights, please. Get your eyes ready for Georgia O'Keeffe and her beautiful art. Please welcome Georgia O'Keeffe. years. <laughs> the last time I felt these rocks, I was in Abiquiu, New Mexico. I collected rocks and wood and bones on the desert floor, and I brought them into my home and placed them on ledges and tables. I lived with these things, and I painted them. I've been asked to talk with you today about myself, my art, and my contribution to the millennium. I don't have a lot of time to talk, and that's good, because I really don't like words. You see, I spoke a language of lines and shapes and colors. To me, that was far more exact than a language of words. So this millennium idea, well, oh, one good thing. They mentioned me as a contemporary American art figure. They didn't distinguish me as a woman, that's good. She continued to look at things from a different point of view and to challenge our own kind of vision. Okay? I suppose in 1999, you might say that I altered perceptions perceptibly. What would I say? Well, I would say that if I enjoyed the flower, I would paint it large enough so you could see what I saw, so you could feel what I felt about painting. Now where I was born and where I have lived and how I have lived is unimportant. It is where I have lived and what I have done that should be of interest. So setting that aside, what I'd like to do is begin with a conversation in 1915. You know, I started making paintings from ideas that were in my head. I set aside my formal education and started looking at things that seemed to be in my mind that I really didn't know about. Well, I bundled all these drawings up and I sent them to my friend Anita Pollitzer in New York. I asked Anita to share them with no one, but Anita took the liberty of sharing them with Alfred Stieglitz. Alfred Stieglitz was a leading photographer in the United States. He was an art impresario, and nine years from this time, I married the man. People wonder how I got along with him. We had a tumultuous existence together. But I said, you know, it's probably that he was interested in what I did, and I was interested in what he did. 
He had a gallery, 291. Well, this is the first place where Picasso showed his work in the United States. Stieglitz felt my work was more inspired than any artist he had ever seen. This is the school where I taught in Texas. And this is the classroom. I was teaching here between 1916 and 1918. And here I am in 1917. And this is one of the paintings I was inspired to make. A large ball of fire, very abstract shape. Well, it was at this time when Stieglitz tried to convince me to come back to New York, said he would support me, so that I didn't have to support myself. Well, he talked me into it. And so began a love affair and an art affair. And he made many photographs of me. Again, and again, and again. And he loved my hands. And he made many nude photographs of me also, but that's for another conversation. Well, in 1925, I made this painting. And people thought, oh, that's definitely a woman making that painting because of the red that I used. And I did crop the edges, but I'm indebted to Stieglitz for that. We saw things in a similar way, as you can see from this photograph, equivalent. And then I made many images that were, had a lot of form like this clamshell, closed clamshell, and open clamshell. Oh, I know, female genitalia. Well, I will say until the day I died, I never meant to paint that. And large oriental poppies. People would ask, why do you make the flowers so big? And I always wondered why they didn't ask me why I made the river so small. New York City at night. Stieglitz wondered why I made this painting. He said, you know, the men haven't even done a very good job with that. But I told him I really loved those little water bottle shapes that the streets made. I thought it was a wonderful view. At about 1929, I became interested in New Mexico and spent time there. It seemed that you didn't need people in the image. The wind, the air, the land became mine when I eventually moved to New Mexico. Rancho's church, this is a large church, but all I needed to do is paint a small portion of this church. Oh yes, Jack in the pulpit. I made many, many paintings of this, and eventually all I needed was the jack, the small portion in the painting. This was made in 1931. I started this painting with the blue drape and the white skull, and that wasn't enough for me, so I added two red stripes. I called it red, white, and blue. Well, everyone was talking about the great American novel, so. I guess I sort of laughed about this and said, well, this is my great American painting. And this image, Summer Days, was on the cover of my autobiography. There was something about the bones in the sky that intrigued me. And this one, Black Crow, sitting on top of the white covered mountain, squeezed between the sky. It seemed that the crows were always coming and going, those black birds. This is my house in Abiquiu, New Mexico. I had to have that door. And yes, this is Ladder to the Moon, bouncing off of Padernal Mountain. You see, I had a bet with God and sort of convinced him, and he told me that if I painted it enough, the mountain would be mine. My friends always laughed at the fact that I was making packs with God. And this painting I made in 1965, my eyesight was really failing me, but I was challenged to make a large painting sky above clouds. This painting is 8 by 24 feet, and I worked day and night from 6 in the morning until sundown, working as hard as I could and as fast as I could. Even though it didn't really fit in with the rest of the things that I made, it was a cornerstone for the Whitney exhibit. This painting, Black Rock on White, is at the end of my painting career. My friend Virginia Christensen said to me that the aura around that haunted her, she re did some reading about it and said that it was like the blackbird without wings. I was emotionally struck by that. And so in 1975, 
I switched from painting to working with clay. Juan Hamilton, who lived and worked with me and took care of me for 11 years, showed me how to work with clay. Even though my images were not as fine as his were, it certainly helped me as far as making my hands do something. Now my life with Juan Hamilton, a lot of things have been said about that, but that's for another conversation. And so this is the end of my art career as you will see it. 11 years passed and I died on March 6th, 1986 at high noon. There was a lot written about me on the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times, but my death really showed no fanfare, no spiritual messages, no inspirational speeches. But what I am reminded of is something that I said to American writer Sherwood Anderson in 1926. Make your unknown known. I'm not sure if I accomplished that, but what I will say is that I'm an artist that lived in my time, that kept pace with my time, and I made paintings so that you could see how I felt about what I did. Please adjust your, your eyes to, to the light and ready your ears because we're changing mediums now. The uh, second millennium not only gave rise to a great, a great plethora of art through the visual arts, but also through music. And now ready your ears for something that occurred in the second millennium, jazz and most notably ragtime with Scott Joplin, uh, 19, excuse me, 1868 to 1917. Uh, gave rise to a wonderful artist and eventually a Pulitzer Prize winner, Scott Joplin, ladies and gentlemen. have these in the 1890s. I'm a Negro, born three, three years after the Civil War ended. My father was a slave. I was born in Northeast Texas, where people of my race were terrorized and on an average every other day lynched in public. I have a dream. My dream is that I develop African-American music on a par with European classical music, the symphony, the opera. And the music that you just heard, Maple Leaf Rag, which was published in 1897, was music that I played for at least 15 years prior to that in bordellos, which is a sort of a fancy word for a house of prostitution, and of course saloons. And I did play in churches when I was a kid in, in Texarkana, Texas. Um, I don't think that without playing that music for you, you might know what ragtime is. How many folks here have ever heard ragtime? All right, that's good makes me very happy. Um, Maple Leaf Rag, very, very syncopated, very, very 
intoxicating. Dance music comes from the culture and the life and the soul of the plantation life of the American Negro. And Maple Leaf Rag was the first piece of music published by a black man in this country. Uh, first piece of sheet music that sold over a million copies, published in 1897 when I was 31 years old. It was uh, a chance for me to take training that I'd received earlier in my life from a German immigrant music teacher in my town of Texarkana, as well as later at the George Smith College in Sedalia, Missouri, to put some of the form and composition of European music style into the uh, American Negro experience. It was so successful and created such a craze among the white community in the American uh, society that um, by the time uh, of the St. Louis exhibition, uh, people were beginning to call it uh, poisonous for young people. Uh, it attracted people who wrote lyrics that were vulgar. And as I understand it from my return visit here, um, you experienced something very much like this in the early 1960s. It was called rock and roll and uh, lyrics were a problem with that. Many people distorted the music that um, I composed, uh, took the medium, and it became absolutely uh, a craze. It even got as far as I understand as a royal presentation in London. Uh, John Philip Sousa uh, used ragtime. Also, um, as you know, I have a dream, and I wanted to write serious music and one of the problems with being known as the king of ragtime was that people could not accept that a black man could write an opera. I wrote two operas, one of which is called Tremonitia in 1911. And I literally probably destroyed my health and my sanity trying to get it published and trying to get it produced during my lifetime. Um, Tremonitia is an opera about uh, a young black girl, a young Negro girl, who was an orphan and uh, was, was uh, taken into the homes of two Negroes in a plantation in Northeast Texas. And the story shows that education and courageous leadership are the only way for the Negro to fully participate in American society. I guess it was too much of an embarrassment for the black community the Negroes in Harlem in the uh, 1911, 12, 13 area were just, I think, embarrassed by my music. And the white people, the white musical establishment did not seem to believe that a Negro could write something as important as a grand opera. In fact, Tremonitia was the first American grand opera. My, um, my life after 19... 15 or 16 was so depressing and so difficult that I ended up in a mental hospital and died in April at the beginning of the First World War in 1917 of insanity. It's great to be here and discover upon my return that the uh, Atlanta and Houston Grand Opera Companies produced a full production of Tremonitia in 1972 in 1975, and that something called the Pulitzer Prize was awarded for my contribution to American music in 1976. So I can say that it's very satisfying to know that you are still dancing to a black man's tune. Thank you. There's, there's no way of knowing the impact that journalism has had on us today. Although, arguably, I think you would all agree, the impact of journalism on the present day has to be huge. The second millennium gave rise to the world's first newspaper in 1609. With us today is the, that first editor of that first new, newspaper, Timotheus Rich. Please welcome him.
I put that up there because uh, I was such a, a nobody as far as a person went that uh, my name wasn't recorded hardly anywhere. And uh, in fact, we couldn't find my name until after the program was produced. So finally, we were able to find my name and I have it there for you, if any of you have to write reports on this. The, the never dull moment type of life of a newspaper man began with me. I'm to blame for the exciting lives that newspaper men and women have today. Um, I also probably can be blamed for the fact that a newsman and woman is underpaid and overworked. However, pretty happy. Uh, none of that has changed in all the years since I pre produced that first newspaper, um, which actually was in 1659 rather than 1609, as it says in the program. So you need to update your reports there, too. Very little is known about me personally. Um, people have always wondered how I could afford a printing press, which was a brand new invention in the 1600s. And uh, there are two ways that I might have afforded, it, afforded that. One is that I might have inherited a lot of money. The second way is that I might have been a mercenary during the Thirty Years' War, which just preceded uh, my first daily newspaper. Um, where I lived was the city of Leipzig, which was the capital of Saxony. And Saxony was the German state that was the center, actually, of this Thirty Years' War. So possibly I knew ways to take advantage financially of what had happened at the end of the war. At the end of the war, it was a tremendous time of rebuilding. There actually was money everywhere. And people were trying to find ways to make more money with the money that was available. Entrepreneurs were coming into Germany from all over the world to find ways to take advantage of the money that was coming into Europe and into Germany. A lot of the source was from the Spanish uh, and Portuguese colonies in South and Central America. So we had a huge time of rebuilding, lots of trading, lots of people coming into our area. And uh, I decided that I needed to take advantage of this. And um, what I did was use the press invented by my fellow countryman, Johann Gutenberg, and he'll speak later tonight. And uh, I created my own newspaper with this press. And I used the ingenuity of what we newsmen still use today. We call them the faithful Ws, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, in order to create a business that was successful. Physically, my Leipziger Relation newspaper did not at all resemble the newspapers of today. I wish that there was something close to it that I could show you, but I do not have anything like that available. It was about nine inches wide, 12 inches deep, printed on just one side. The type was large, and it was metal type. It was large because it was very difficult to make, and it was fortunate that it was large because hardly anybody had glasses. And that way, everybody that was literate was able to read the paper, even if they had a tough time seeing it. Another reason that I was lucky that we had middle type was that since I was producing a daily paper, this type got a great deal of wear and tear and wooden type, which had preceded the metal type, would not have been able to withstand this wear and tear. Yeah, um, I printed the world's first daily newspaper, but I'll tell you a secret. All that was really daily was the date at the top of the paper. <laughs> Don't tell any of the people that bought this. Uh, 
Uh, I changed the content when I needed to. Uh, but other than that, the date was all that changed every day. How on earth did I get away with this? Well, as I told you, I was a pretty smart marketeer. And I sold my paper only to people that were in town for one day. <laughs> okay? They would come in on the stagecoach. Well, the only people that could ride stagecoaches were the very wealthy. And these were these traders that I was talking about that were coming into town looking for opportunities. So they were wealthy, they could read, and they were traveling, and they had time, and they usually were in town for just one day, and I sold them my paper for exorbitant prices. Okay? Um, the paper contained things that uh, aren't in most newspapers today, but you'll see them in specialty papers. The papers contained safety tips of how to ride a stagecoach and what you might expect from robberies and uh, from different inns in the different towns that might be trying to jip you out of your money one way or another. I had lots of information pertaining to the different cargoes and embargoes and trade, trades and, and um, uh, taxes that were levied on the different goods as you went from state to state and country to country. Uh, I also had lengthy reading pieces for enjoyment for people that could read on their long rides and actually when they got to the coast, when they would journey to America, they could read them on their voyages. I did not include political or religious writing. This was the age of absolutism, and I knew my paper would be most safe if I didn't print political or religious material. Probably the most popular item in my newspaper was a rating system that hinted on the different skills of the prostitutes in the different inns. <laughs> I got away with this by not using plain language. I used a very flowery language that only very literate people could get at what I was hinting at. And the local constables, of course, wouldn't comprehend what all this flowery writing involved. You might say that I was the world's, world's first daily pornographer. My work was exciting. I gathered the news. I wrote the news. I edited the news. I printed the news. And I sold the news all by myself. I hobnobbed with the rich. I sold my product to them. I gathered my news from them. Today's gossip became tomorrow's news. You can see nothing has changed. <laughs> so buy your papers from me. The daily relation is on sale. You'll just have to use your imagination to see what it was like. Thank you. The third millennium will have trouble competing with the second millennium because of all the great composers and musicians throughout this last millennium, uh, such as Beethoven, such as, as Mozart, such as Joplin. And certainly from 1685 to 1750, it will have trouble competing with the great composer and German organist Johann Sebastian Bach. Please welcome him.
Music is my only voice. And the, the whole aim of my entire life was to find the greatest extent to which I could take the potential of music. It wasn't by mistake that I became a musician, though. My father was a musician. My father's father was a musician. His father was a musician. My uncles were musicians. My cousins were musicians. My brothers were musicians. Indeed, it was my father who taught me the violin and viola as a young boy. And after he died, it was my brother who took me in and showed me how to play the organ. But remember, music is my only voice. That got me into quite a bit of trouble as I went out into the world to work as a musician. In my first position as an organist and choir master, I had to work with a very very, very rowdy bunch of boys. Every Sunday, getting them to perform the music of the church. And one particular occasion, one of those boys, who played the bassoon very badly, and wasn't much of a musician besides, challenged my authority as the leader of the group. He went so far as to take a cane to me, while I, to protect myself, attacked him with my knife. It was within my rights. I was the person that was right there. In my next position, <laughs> things were going along rather well as an organist in the church. They even gave me a one-month absence so that I could go listen to a very fine organist you may not know of, but you should, named Dietrich Buxtehude. It was about a 200-mile walk, so it took me a while anyway. Uh, but things being what they were, when I got there, I decided to stay a little longer. He played really well, and I wanted to hear concerts and drink in the coffee house and visit with friends. So indeed, I was gone not one month, but about four. This upset my employers a little bit. So at my next position, <laughs> things were going along rather well, too, as the organist, until one day somebody reported that I was uh, giving private lessons to a young woman in the choir loft. On the way to my next position, I married that young woman. She indeed was one of my cousins, another musician, Barbara Bach. Finally, at that position, I stayed for a while. The Duke of Weimar was a very nice old man, a little bit conservative, but he seemed to appreciate my music, and I did a very good job of providing music for him in the church. Wherever I was asked to provide music, I did the best I could. Music is my only voice. But that didn't go along too well. After a while, he was getting a little old for me. And his nephew came along one day and, and offered his nephew, the Prince Leopold, uh, offered me a position in his court. Uh, you had to get permission to leave. And so I, I asked the Duke of Weimar to leave his position so I could take this position that was more interesting to me. The Duke was not very much into that. And I asked him again. And, he said no again, and I asked him again, and he said no again, but I knew I was right, so I asked him again. At that point, he threw me in jail, uh, but he knew that I was a very fine organist, so he couldn't keep me there. So on the way to my next position, uh, the Prince, of, Prince Leopold was very good to me. He appreciated all the musical skills that I had. I didn't only write music for the church there. I had, of course, written several cantatas and very many other religious works up to this time and things for my family, but I hadn't had as much opportunity to write things for the secular world in chamber music. This was the period when I wrote such pieces as the Brandenburg Concerti and the Well-Tempered Clavier. Indeed, the Well-Tempered Clavier I wrote because I, because I wanted to experience the full extent of what music had to offer. I developed a scale at the time called the well-tempered tuning of the scale. Now before, you couldn't play in all keys on the harpsichord. It wouldn't sound very good after a while if you modulated too far. I thought that is limiting the musician. So I figured out a way on my own to tune the harpsichord so you could play in any key evenly. And I wrote not one set of 24 pieces for every single key, but two to celebrate this fact. Things didn't go completely well with Prince Leopold either. Of 
course, I had my first wife near the end of my uh, tenure at the, uh, Prince Leopold's court, uh, became very ill and died while I was away with the prince. We often went on tour uh, playing chamber music together. He enjoyed that. And when I came back, I hadn't even known it and my wife was dead. And I was left to take care of my children. Of course, you know I had 20, uh, but not all by the first wife. I only had seven children by our first wife and only four of them survived, but it was still, I had mouths to feed and I was all alone. I decided because the prince was wearying of me and his wife was too, to go on to my final position in Leipzig. I was not the first choice of the people in Leipzig. They wanted somebody else named Georg Philipp, uh, Philipp Telemann, but they didn't get him. They wanted somebody else after him, but they didn't get him either because he became sick or some such thing. And so they finally took me as the alternative. But I provided them the best I could. Remember, music is my only voice. Every Sunday I would write a new piece to the extent that I developed enough pieces for an entire five-year cycle of the Lutheran Church. I even kept all the boys for four churches of Leipzig in order. Another rowdy bunch of somewhat half-talented young men, but I made them play the music up to the standard that it needed to be played. They never appreciated me very much there. I told them that they needed better musicians and they needed to spend more money on the music, but they didn't listen to me very well. I provided music I provided music of grand consequence there. One of the pieces I wrote was four hours long, St. Matthew's Passion. I wrote that piece like I wrote all the pieces of my life, and you can understand why I'm, music is my only voice and why I take it so seriously and why I would get into fights with people about music because for my entire life, the reason for music, in my view, it's not for the church or for the people in the church or for the prince, but only, only the final aim of music is the glorification of God himself. In recent times, we've become very used to democracies and socialist countries and communist countries and military juntas. But to tell you the truth, throughout most of the second millennia, what was the mainstay in our political systems were monarchies. And now I'd like to introduce a member of the monarchy uh, from 1519 to 1589. Uh, she was in France, Catherine de' Medici, and she was the king of Henry II and to represent the monarchical form of government, please welcome Catherine. Thank you. I was the queen, not the king. <laughs> While I lived during the 16th century, I was the most important woman in Europe. Think about that. The most important woman in Europe in the 16th century. I lived most of that century because I lived till I was 70 years old. How many women in those days lived till they were 70 years old? What kept me going? Why was I so involved in the French government? One reason is because I married into it. Francis I was responsible for my life, responsible to bring me. I was plucked out of Italy. I'm a Florentine. I was born in Italy, plucked me from my homeland, took me into France. I very much enjoyed the days that I was in France. I worked very hard at being the queen mother. My life was not always easy. When I was born, my father and my mother, soon after that, passed away. It is said that my dad, my father had syphilis and passed it to my mother. After they passed away, I went to live with one of my relatives. Uh, my family was very influential in Italy, 
and a lot and my uncle owned a lot of property in the middle of Italy so from, when Francis the king of France Francis the first was looking for someone for his to marry his son it was very much intertwined religious political monetary who can we find to marry our sons well I was chosen because Francis and Pope Clement who was my uncle spotted the deal so at the age of 14, I ended up moving to France and marrying Henry II. My married life was fraught from the very beginning. Although I had a beautiful wedding, the wedding was so grand. I received all sorts of things, jewels, the biggest pearls you ever saw, uh, beautiful draperies and materials, and a chateau. How many of you got a chateau when you got married? with all the people that would wait on me. It was wonderful. But my husband had a mistress from the very beginning of our marriage. He not only turned to her for solace and visited her chateau more than he did my chateau, but he would turn to her when he became king for political advice. This was very hard for me. When I first came to France and became the wife of Henry, I loved Francis I, who was king. I loved being his daughter-in-law. He would take me riding. And if you ever saw what we rode on, it was we always had to ride side saddle. We couldn't ever straddle a horse. It wasn't proper in those days. Well, there was a board that we would put our feet on, and, and we couldn't even keep up with the men. So what kind of riding and what kind of a hunt was that? So one of my contributions to the French civilization and civilization after that was to develop a better saddle. So I developed a side saddle and could keep up with Francis and go on hunts and so forth with him. So that was part of my education with him, but also he helped me learn how to run the kingdom, which benefited me for the next 40 years. Because what happened was my husband was the ruler of France for 12 years. During those 12 years, I had to take a back seat. I was not looked at very uh, important politically because I married into the family because of what Pope Clement, my uncle, could give to the French community. But my uncle passed away one year after I was married. So I was no adva advantage to the French community after that, and especially not very important to my husband. And after that, I did not bear children for 10 years. So what good was I as a wife? After I did start bearing children, I had quite a few. So 10 children is what I gave to my husband. And this became my life to preserve the kingdom of France and to also watch out after my children. So the greatest contribution that I gave to the country of France, I felt, was holding the country together with the same continuous dynasty for 40 years. But it was not easy because my husband died at a young age. And when he died, our oldest son was 16 years old. Anyone here that's 16? In the audience, you want to stand up? <laughs> Just one minute, one second. All right, this is how old my son, okay, thank you very much. This is how old my son was when he became king of France. He was old enough that he could be the French leader by himself, so I didn't need to assist him much, although I was always by his side and always trying to give him advice. He was a very sickly young man, and in one year he died. The, so who became the natural ruler? Our oldest son, the second son, was only 10 years old. Anyone that's 10 here? No? You want to stand up? This is the age of my son when he became the ruler of France. So you can imagine how hard it was for him to be able to make decisions. I got to become the regent, so I was not only queen, a queen mother, but a regent for 40 years in France. So I was always 
there beside that son who actually reigned for 15 years. It was very important to us and our culture in those days to marry off our daughters to people that were very important in status. So I felt I did a very good job with my daughters because two of my daughters became queen and one became a duchess. And out of our family, three of our sons were kings, one for one year, one for 15 years, and then after he passed away, then our next son who became the leader for, actually he, for, for 15 years. I was not looked at in very good favor. Now look at me, do you think that I should be described as a serpent who came from tainted parents? Do you think I should look, be looked at as a she-devil who held royal power? Or do you think, this is very nice, they called me the maggot that crawled out from behind the Italian tomb. How would you like to be called that? Why did they do that? Why did I have a bad reputation at the end of my life when all I did was devote my entire life to the French culture? Well, one of the reasons is because during that era, the 16th century, there was constant fighting. Uh, the growth of Protestantism, Protestantism caused political chaos all over. So the Protestants were becoming very powerful, challenging the Catholics. And nobles from all the Catholic religions were being drawn into Protestantism. That's very hard for me to say. Organizing, gaining military power, holding meetings, all of it behind the scenes. So what I did was I consistently strived to bring peace to the kingdom by healing the religious divisions. So I would arrange assemblies, I would arrange treaties, I would try and get these people to conciliate with one another. I tried to bring peace to France in the age of frenzies, religious hatred. I promised them liberty, I promised them security for years. Well, it backfired. There was too much political chaos, too much religious fighting going on. And what motivated me, remember I'm a mother, when you weigh your values, what is more important, liberty to your country and your fellow man, or protecting your children? Maybe there were some decisions I made that were not the best thing. As the country disintegrated, my overriding concern, my concerns were for the interest of my children. I was tireless, tireless in bringing efforts to protect the inheritance of my sons. It was always being challenged. The Protestants were trying to get more power to take over the throne. The Catholics were raising, rising in power against the Protestants and the, the kingdom was always in the middle. This was very hard for me to assist my sons. I tried very hard to get my daughter into advantageous uh, marriages. What hangs over my head, the biggest cloud that hangs over my head is called the Massacre of St. Bartholomew. This was a decision that I might have been a part of, history's not too sure of, but thousands and thousands of Protestants were killed in this massacre. What happened in those days, there was a leader of the Protestants, uh, Coligny, that was very close to my son. And he was getting closer and closer, and my son was listening to him more and listening to me less. And I was very afraid of the power that he was exhibiting. So I was very concerned that the kingdom might fall. One time when my son and I passed through Paris, he tried to kidnap us. And I thought, this is it. From that moment on, all the conciliation on my part was dropped. So we devised a plan to take his life. Well, what happened was the guard of my son went to the hotel where Coligny was staying, shot him, threw him out the window, ran down the steps, wiped the blood off of him, cut off his head, and brought the head to my son and I. We rejoiced he was no longer a threat to us. So we had his head embalmed, and we had the head taken to the Pope and to his cardinals, and they rejoiced that he was no longer there also. 
what happened was um, an effect where peop other people started getting involved, the group think of let's get those Protestants. So Protestants were being massacred all over. Protestants were being massacred um, by people of authority, by just people on the street, um, especially after the way that uh, Coligny was treated because his body was dragged through the streets for days and then hung for everyone to see. So this was a mass slaughter all over France, and that's the black cloud that's hung over me. After that happened to me and to my family, I have been part of a black legend. Due to the printing press, they printed all the pamphlets, putting a lot of truths and untruths about me and passed them all over France, all over Germany, all over Italy, and defamed my name. I tried so hard after my second son died to help my third son in his reign, but he was more stubborn. He didn't want to listen to me. And he could see that the Catholics were getting much more powerful than what he wanted. So he had the head of the Catholic party or the Catholic, very powerful person in the Catholic religion killed. That was so hard for me because I thought, I know what the result will be. I know that my son, Henry III, will be assassinated. At that time, I was 70 years old, and I went to bed and said, I can't deal with this. A few days later, I died. After that, my son was massacred. Now, some of the contributions that I did make to France, one was holding the dynasty together during this time of unrest, Another, I brought the fork, the fork that we use today. I brought that to the culture of France. Another was a side saddle. Another was introducing the ballet. I loved ballet, also added a wing to the Louvre. But my biggest contribution, I felt, and the biggest interest for me was my children. I was first and foremost a mother with a crown. Thank you. How many of you listened to Martin Luther this morning? Okay, let's grade, uh, do a little grading here like we're familiar with at the college, A, B, C, D, F. What grade do you think Martin Luther would give to the Pope at that time? That was Leo X, uh, when he posted the 95 Thesis on the door at Wittenberg. What grade would he have given Pope Leo X? Minus 10. Yeah, probably, probably pretty low. Yeah. There is a pope, though, in the 20th century, and I think if Martin Luther had been alive, he would have given a much, much higher grade. I'll let you judge for them yourselves, but I believe this man is a very great man, a very magnificent pope. I'd like to introduce his pope, John the 23rd. Catherine, you were 70. I was 77 when elected pope. I didn't think I'd have too much time. But in my short five years as pope, I began a work that changed the Catholic Church and its understanding in the world. Few people expected a 77-year-old man to be such an ambitious changer of, of, of history. The conventional opinion was that, was that I, Angelo Giuseppe Arancali would be a caretaker pope. I would just keep St. Peter's chair warm. <laughs> my career as a priest wasn't anything too fancy. I taught in a seminary and worked for my bishop my first 10 years. Then a three-year stint as an army chaplain in World War I. Then national director in Italy for spreading the faith. Then surprise. I was appointed as the Pope's representative in Bulgaria, then Turkey, then in France. Finally, I came home to Italy as Cardinal Archbishop of Venezia, of Venice. Ah, beautiful, beautiful Venice. For six years, where I loved the people. 
Then in October 1958, I went to Rome. And guess what? The Cardinali elected me, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, as Pope. I guess my experience as administrator, diplomat, worker with people of different churches, and my love of people, and my vision of what the church should be and needed to be, must have sealed my fate. So I came out dressed like I am, with a new name, John the 23rd. The day after my first Christmas as Pope in 1958, I shocked the people when I, the Pope, went to prison not as a guest, but to visit, to visit the prisoners. I called the prisoners my dear sons and brothers. I go and went down and I shook each hand, but one prisoner drew back from me. Holy Father, he said, I am a murderer. I said nothing, I simply hugged him. He told me it was the happiest day of my life and mine too. I found plenty to think about as I read papers and heard reports. I looked at the world and wondered about the role of the church. Is my church a seed or, or a pearl? Is it only the pearl of great price to be preserved from all possible co contamination? Is the church also the seed that must burrow into the earth of the poor and bring them new hope? Should it not penetrate the soil of the rich and the mighty that their consciences might be touched by the gospel of Jesus? Yes, I heard critics complain that the church was irrelevant. My critics claimed that people had stopped turning to the church for meaning. Of course the gospel is precious, but the gospel must be allowed to take root in the lives of men and women. If it does not take root, it will not be believed. If it is too protected, the gospel becomes like a museum piece, admired by tourists who give it a quick glance. But you see, people are saved by the living word of God, not by a lifeless trophy. And so I decided that the church, as God's seed, had to be poured forth into the world. An idea came to me one day like a ray of blinding light, a council, a council, a worldwide council, all of the bishops of the world coming. And so on January 25th, 1959, I went to the Basilica of St. Paul in Rome to celebrate there the 1900th anniversary of St. Paul writing his letter to the Romans. After the service, I gathered the 18 cardinals who were there and talked to them about the present state of the church and the world. I said to them, your eminences, these problems must be faced. I intend to call a council of the universal church. I would like to have your advice. The cardinals were so surprised that they said nothing. Mute. Finally, my advisors offered many objections. Even Holy Father, it may take as long as 20 years to get ready for so vast a gathering. I had no intention of waiting that long. I'm an old man, I'm 79. You get the council going in two years, two years. And so on September 11th, 1962, I opened the council, Vatican Council number two. And the purpose of the council was aggiornamento, updating. The purpose of the council was to open the windows of the church This would be a large, this would have a large ripple effect for the rest of the world. That God's treasures would be available to all people. 
The council was not called to condemn errors. No. The church today needed the medicine of mercy more than severity. So this council would be pastoral and would try to and would try to express the substance of the faith in new language. The church needs to move more and more into the future. And so the project was ecumenical worldwide from the outset because it concentrated on the mind of the gospel. Fortunately, my superior is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been at work in the world. And so I looked at the signs of the times. Yes, the Spirit was at work because colonialism was dying. There was the emancipation of the working class and the promotion of women in society. In my mind, the council was an event of the Holy Spirit in which the whole church would be involved. Everyone was urged to say my prayer, renew thy wonders in this day by a new Pentecost. And so, Sorelli e Fratelli, the council's immediate task was the renewal of the religious life of the church, updating the church's teachings, discipline, and organization. But its ultimate goal was the prayer of Jesus that all might be one, the unity of Christians. The council would be the greatest council held by the church so far. The number of participants, 3,000 people, most representative in terms of nations and cultures, native clergy, native bishops, representative in the fact that non-Catholics and lay observers were invited to be part of this council. And of course, we live in the modern age, modern means of communication and transportation. It was not a call simply to repeat ancient formulas or to condemn those who are dissident. On the contrary, when I opened the council, I said my goal was to eradicate the seeds of discord and, pro and to promote peace and unity for all humankind. In a word, the council was a council unique in the history of the church because it was really the first ecumenical, really the first worldwide council. And as such, culturally, it also did something important. It signaled the church's movement from a church, especially that was just European, to a genuine world church. And so this first period of the council extended from October 62 to December 62. That would be my only time at the council. Because just a week after I opened the council, I realized that I was suffering from stomach cancer. Nothing was said publicly, but I realized that if the council would last more than one session, I would not be able to see it through. I said to a friend, at least I've launched this big ship. Others will have to bring it to port. And others have brought it into port. Yes, the Catholic Church, after the conclusion of the Council in 1965, is much, much different from the Catholic Church before 1965. Even the Catholic Church, much different from the time of Martin Luther in 1517. And so the work was begun in that first session. I could now go home to God. First, I had a little work to do, though. I encouraged Nikita Khrushchev to back out of Cuba. And guess what? He did. And I wrote my last will and testament, peace on earth. Arrivederci.
We have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please address whom you'd like to have answer your question. And hopefully, they'll be kind enough to do so. Yes. Hobbies. Well, I would say I was an artist through and through, and the kind of things that I did in my life always related to my art. Um, I was the kind of person that was really reluctant to do other things. I kind of made check sheets. If I do this, then I won't be in the studio. If I do that, it'll take away time from the studio. So I was really driven by working in the studio. Um, I like to walk, spend a lot of time outside, um, but primarily I was an artist. I lived my life thinking about the next thing that I was going to do. What was the other part? Well, what's the inspiration for the artwork you're doing now? Young ages meaning when I started. Well, in the beginning, my formal education really directed the kind of things that I would work with. And so William Merritt Chase, Arthur Dow were instructors of mine. And they would establish the things that I would work with. But after about 1915, um, I was motivated by images that were in my mind that my mind seemed to know more about than I did. And so from that point, I started using things that were interesting to me that I would find, such as rocks and flowers and shells and things that I was interested in that I made larger so that they could be hopefully, so that they could hopefully show people what I was interested in. You're welcome. My successor, uh, Paolo Giovanni Segundo, yeah. good man, good. good man. Vision Church, probably different from mine. Good man, much gifts, very tired. He wants to live to the year 2000 to bring in the new millennium, and he will, because he is a stubborn Polak. <laughs> uh, but good, uh, theologian, philosopher, writer, um, yes, writer, author, not only in the uh, religious realm, but also in the secular realm, okay? Good man, um, I love the Pope. The question is, what is the level of education for each one of these characters? And so if we'll start over here with Mr. Joplin and, and go around and, and just uh, let the person know what level of education you achieved in your lifetime. I uh, didn't complete high school, but I did have uh, some college courses in music. My formal education consisted of going to the gymnasium and the lyceum which I completed by the time I was about 16 or 17 years old. That would have been what you would call high school. After that, I taught myself by copying the scores of other composers and going to listen to their music and developing the music as best I could because at the age of 18, I was forced to fend for myself, support myself through my music. I'm afraid my education is unknown, although I was one of the few literates 
in the 1600s? My formal education was mostly in the convent. Um, I lived with my uncle uh, for years and then uh, did live in a convent and was formally taught by the nuns for, I think it was five to six years. But then I was very, I, I love to read and I love to absorb. So any chance that I had, I, I would take advantage of anybody that was around that could teach me anything at all from the time I was a very young girl. As a cleric, I perhaps was very well educated because uh, we had seminary and then, of course, we had college, postgraduate, and then, and then advanced degrees. So, well educated. I did have an advanced degree and I also taught. Um, I was the head of the art department at West Texas, West Texas State Normal College, and I was primarily taught by William Merritt Chase and Arthur Dow. Okay, I believe there was a question. Over here? Yes. That's a good question, and we're going to have them do that just in, in a couple of minutes. We have time for about one more question, then they will become their old self. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not aware of any, of any symphonies or, or any uh, grand operas. I'd like to ask John, if, if he had been Pope longer, would women have become priests? <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit knows, and he hasn't told me. Uh, remember, uh, John died after the first session of the council, and so it fell to his successor, Paul VI, to reactivate the council because the council was automatically suspended with the death of the pope. And so uh, Paul VI, who was uh, Giovanni Battista Montini from Milano, was elected as my successor, and um, he continued my work. Uh, the second session of the council was not a very happy one for him. But the work began to really progress, and uh, the documents and the constitutions um, continued on very much into the uh, making of the, of, the, of the Catholic Church as it is in the world today, and as it has reached out to, to uh, worldwide. I would say that probably the answer would be no, because I think the church as liberal with this, uh, not a, that's a poor word, but the church with its modernizing, with its updating tendencies may have seen the ordination of women within the Catholic tradition as just impossible. So I would say probably not. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. <laughs> and if we don't have it, that's okay. We'll get by and we'll go on. No last question? Okay, what I think I'll do now is to honor uh, the request uh, of our guest here in the front row, and that is for each one of you to come out of character. As much as it's hard to let go of that character, come out and be yourself, and if you will tell the audience, uh, first of all, who you are, what it is that you do, and why you chose this character, and what you learned about yourself in developing this character. And Mr. Joplin, uh, Mr. Joplin we'll start with you. My name is Dave Remington. I'm uh, a librarian, a reference librarian here at the college. Um, I work in the evenings here answering people's questions and helping them find out how to find things. And I've been playing Scott Joplin's music for about 20 years. And I ran into the um, Popcorn Forum when I came here last summer and uh, said, hey, that would be a great chance to find out. My first, um, my first trepidation was how could a white man represent a black man. But that soon got lost in discovering what it was like to try to be and understand this person. I must have spent about 120 hours reading and studying and thinking and trying to figure it out. So it's really been um, a great opportunity to, uh, a very spiritual opportunity to understand myself and another person.
my name is Gerard Mathis. I'm a music theory teacher here, or I should say the music theory teacher here at North Idaho College. Um, uh, actually, the, the idea of doing Bach was suggested to me, but I'm very glad I did it. I teach his music all the time in my classes, and I know a great deal about him already, but by reading more about him, it was interesting to find out that there's a sort of a myth about Bach to some degree that indeed his music was completely forgotten after he died. He was a working musician, and he didn't expect music to go beyond his life. Indeed, he really believed that his music was for the glory of God. So he's a very religious and well-read uh, theologically. But his music wasn't really. There is this, this story about uh, really forgotten. The story about Mendelssohn uh, in the 19th century, about 100 years after Bach's death, not quite, uh, reviving his music in the St. Matthew Passion, which is a four-hour work. It's a stupendous accomplishment, actually, especially considering he had 20 children, he had two wives, he had to take care of 54 choir boys at four churches at the end of his life, and he was going blind. That was the other major thing. But indeed, people like Beethoven and Mozart and Haydn would have known about Bach even shortly after his death, because they were individuals, maybe not the general public, but individuals including his sons, who kept his music alive and essentially proselytized for him so that everyone knew about it. It was just a major event when it came back to the whole public. Another just slight interesting tidbit is his second wife, which, who was about 12 years younger than he was, who had 13 children by him. Um, as soon as he died, they had nothing such thing as Social Security, and his sons by his previous marriage, who were famous musicians themselves, were kind of nasty guys because they didn't take care of their stepmother very well. And indeed, even though Bach didn't die in uh, uh, poor, his wife did. And his wife with his daughters, even though his sons had plenty of money and all his manuscripts, just let them starve to death. Interesting tidbit. Uh, my name is Nils Rosdahl, and I'm journalism teacher uh, here at NIC. Uh, I was assigned to uh, uh, research the world's first daily newspaper man. And uh, after many hours on the internet, all I found was his name. That's all I could find. Um, several weeks ago, I went to New York on another uh, journey, and I spent four hours in the New York Public Library, found nothing on this fellow. So I came back deciding that I would have to give up. And I was whining to my students that I was going to give up on this project. When, where's Murad? There. <laughs> when uh, Murad over here, who is one of my journalism students, and he's a foreign exchange student from Turkmenistan, he suggested, well, what about Rich Hyman? And Rich Hyman in 1985, was a German foreign exchange student here to NIC, and he majored in journalism. And he stayed with the same host family that Murad was staying, is staying with. And so I asked them if they knew how I could get in touch with Rich Hyman in Germany. They knew. I faxed him what I needed. All I had was this fellow's name and the name of the newspaper. Twelve hours later, I had a two-page single space uh, email just with every de detail I could ever want on this guy. So we owe it to an NIC alumni and two foreign students helping me. Thank you. Well, I've really enjoyed being Catherine. Um, the character was actually chosen, and and then I was asked if I would represent her. One reason I have enjoyed. Um, reading about her so much is to learn about another woman's life in the 16th century. I'll tell you one thing, I would hate to wear this to work every day. Um, but also what motivated her um, and, and learning about history. I think history is kind of boring when you just read history books, but when you read about history through a person's life, it brings everything to life, what's going on in the era. Uh, everything around it, and, and to me it was real stimulating. So I've read two different books about her life. 
Um, and the motivator for her was, of course, her family, the Kingdom of France, and trying to think, uh, keep things together. And to me, the most important job in my entire life has been a mother. And one of my daughters, as you see, is in the back of the room. So I very much related to Catherine because that was what was the most important thing to her. Thank you. Well, I am a father, but and hopefully someday he'll be a holy father. Uh, my name is Father Roger Lachance. I'm pastor of St. Pius X Catholic Church here in, in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, like several of our August members, I was asked if I would consent to this particular role. I said, oh, come on, Tony, you've got to be kidding me. I can't do that. He's short and fat, and I'm tall and skinny. It's not to matter, OK? So anyway, uh, after much arm twisting, I said, OK, sure, I'll do it. Uh, with a little bit of nervousness. I was alive uh, in, in high school, senior in high school, when Pius XII died in 1958. And all of a sudden, this fat little Italian, who we didn't know about, whose name was Ron Colley, and we said, Ron Kelly, who's he? No, Ron Kelly? Ron, never mind. It, we tried to make an Irishman out of him instead of an Italian, Ron Colley. And he just surprised the world to surprise the world uh, by uh, who he was. And as I said, uh, uh, the council uh, certainly has impacted my seminary training because I was in the seminary when the council was going on in the 60s. And um, the theology and uh, priests were ordained uh, before I came on the scene, uh, their theology was different um, because of the emphasis of that John John XXIII and his successor Paul VI had in, in continuing the work of the council. And uh, so much so that if I were to ask uh, Father Hasries, what do you call the council that you, you share? The National Church. No, you're, you're in your parish. What do you call it? Vestry. Vestry. Well, we would call ours the pastoral council. So the whole idea of pastry, of pastoring the whole people of God. So. John, uh, John the 23rd, marvelous man, um, tremendous insights, uh, tremendously common man, born very poor. The story is told that when the news came over the radio in, in, uh, in, uh, in Italy, oh my God, they made a, a little Angelo Pope. We have to, he's going to work so hard. That's what his sister said. So, okay. Hello. My name is Allie Kurtzvogt, and I teach at North Idaho College in the art department. And what I've found to be most um, important is that I can do it. What I've found to be most interesting is the fact that um, as a researcher, you're responsible for everything with this character. So you're looking very carefully at that person. and. It was very interesting to do that, given the fact that I have studied Georgia O'Keeffe since I was a late teenager, what, 19, 18 years old, um, till my present age of 44. And so amalgamating all of that information together um, and realizing how I felt about someone when I was 18 and now at the age of 44, and also putting together the information and the work that I've seen of hers becomes a very interesting swirl of ideas and um, thoughts. What I found to be probably most valuable is that I can use this in teaching. And what I would like to do is um, put together a series of, of short study quips on a number of women artists, because I think there is a lack of attention toward women artists. and. I think students could learn more easily by looking at people in character, and it may be more interesting to inject that into a college survey of art experience. Thanks. Our scholars did a great job. Please give them all a big round of applause.
I'd like to encourage you, if you can, to attend the response panel at 7 o'clock tonight, right here in the same room. Our moderator will be Tony Stewart, and we'll have Johann Gutenberg, Sigmund Freud, Carlotta Spears Bass, Stephen Langston, Martin Luther, and Clay, Dr. Clay Jenkinson playing himself. That should be a very interesting response panel. Thank you all for coming. Uh, great to see the good turnout. If you'll please fill out those buff forms, really appreciate it. Thank you very much.